the fragrance of selfless love that has drawn the world into one family. The truth of an eternal message that has been revealed through every act and word. The fulfillment in service that has been taught by relentless sacrifice. The Lord's own life is indeed His message. Sai Ram and welcome to the second episode in our special teleseries entitled The Message of the Lord. Just to recall, this series offers the essence of the teachings of Bhagwan Baba in the context of today's world, especially the various critical problems that humanity currently faces. Last time, we began with the historic date 20th of October 1940, the day on which Baba, then a young 14-year-old, left school and family to serve humanity. After that, we went into a flashback mode and starting with the incarnation on 23rd November 1926, came up to the 25th birthday in 1950, when Swami formally inaugurated what was then popularly called the New Mandir. Back in those early days, devotees thought of the Mandir in Prashanti Nilayam merely as a permanent replacement for the tin shed that earlier served as Swami's residence with adequate space now for regular public darshans. That it certainly was. But few realized that this would also be Swami's headquarters for a mind-boggling mission that would be quietly unveiled, slowly and in stages, without much fanfare. The mission unfolded to reveal its amazing scope and dimensions. However, the message behind the mission continues to be largely missed. Which is why the main focus of this series is the message, presented of course with glimpses of his mission as well. Let us pick up from the point where the so-called New Mandir was formally inaugurated on 23rd November 1950. Almost the very first thing that Swami did was to offer daily darshan, in fact twice a day. Along with darshan, bhajan singing too became an integral part of daily routine and has remained so ever since, indeed right up to the present time. Word spread and though Puttaparthi was not easily accessible, the crowds came every day without fail. The devotees who came managed with their self-created temporary shelters. Many even lived under trees and bore many difficulties, all because they wanted to enjoy the bliss of darshan. Every day, a lucky few began to be called for the famous interview, when they could experience divine bliss exclusively and at very close quarters. All this was of course with a deep purpose. God comes down in human form mainly to lift humans to the level of God. It is an act of supreme compassion. As Swami himself once described it, it is like a mother bending down to pick up her child and holding it close to her. Right from the early days, Baba systematically and consistently stressed the sublime and highest aspects of spirituality rather than religion. Since the Vedas, which represent an integral part of ancient India, extol the highest aspects of spirituality, Swami began to take keen interest in promoting the revival of interest in the Vedas, especially because public interest in them was beginning to decline, thanks to lifestyle changes brought about by the industrialization of India. Swami began to interact frequently with Vedic scholars, Initially, many of these scholars were rather skeptical about Swami's knowledge of the Vedas. However, after initial doubts, 
all Vedic scholars unreservedly accepted that Swami was indeed the very personification of the Vedas. One outstanding Vedic scholar who accepted Swami's divinity without any reservation was a late Sri Kamavadhani. Once Kamavadhani came to Baba, he stayed with him till he passed away at the ripe old age of 100. On Swami's instructions, Sri Kamavadhani began tutoring students and other seekers in Vedic chanting. If one sees extensive Vedic chanting by Swami's students these days, it is all due to the pioneering efforts of Kamavadhani made a long time ago. Interestingly, these days one can, on occasions, see even overseas devotees chanting the Vedas with great enthusiasm. Swami no doubt actively encourages the chanting of the Vedas. At the same time, he is equally insistent that mere chanting would not do. Rather, in the true spirit of the Vedas, one must see God everywhere. And the best way to get started is by actively getting involved in selfless service, that is, to see service to society as service to God. Thus it is that many decades ago, Swami launched the Sri Satya Sai Seva or service organization, first on a national and soon on an international scale. When Baba introduced service as a mission objective, he told the service volunteers, Seva Dals as they were called, always perform your service, seeing God in the one whom you serve. And after completing your task, do not talk about how your service has benefited others. Instead, you should ask how performing the service has improved you. Over the years, Sai service has become truly global. You see Seva Dals regularly doing duty in Prashanti Nilayam throughout the year, especially at festival times. Sai service has also spread to all corners of India and indeed the world itself. Sai volunteers serve during normal times. And they are also available when disaster strikes. The unique thing about Baba's service organization is that every bit of service rendered has a spiritual basis. What you are about to see is Gram Seva in Durban, inspired entirely by the Gram Seva done by Swami students in villages around Prashanti Nilayam. The scenes speak for themselves. 
O Lord of my being, O Lord of my being, Bhagwan Baba, Bhagwan Baba, I thank thee for the opportunity, I thank thee for the opportunity to serve in your name and consciousness. To serve in your name and consciousness. I undertake this seva as a sadhana. I undertake this seva as a sadhana. May it generate compassion. May it generate compassion. Inspire prema. Inspire prema. And strengthen my faith and devotion in thee. And, and strengthen my faith and devotion in thee. Bhagwan Baba. Bhagwan Baba. I surrender myself. I surrender myself as your instrument. As your instrument. And dedicate this sadhana. And dedicate. At thy lotus feet. At thy lotus feet. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Service to mankind, the service to God. So, but we've got to remember that Swami is omnipresent, is omniscient, right? Is omnipotent. Okay. So he's everywhere, is all the time, ever. There's no place he's not. So, so let us do it with joy, right? And let those who receive also be joyful because we are giving a gift from Swami to Swami. Okay. Today we're doing a Grama Seva program. We've uh, planned this a few days ago and this area, there's a lot of needy people. It's one of the poverty stricken areas. We've made up 350 amper packs, uh, made up of uh, groceries, vegetable and blankets as well, which we're giving out to these people. And we want to continue this on a, on a three monthly basis. constantly reminds us that once we make a promise, we must never fail to keep it. Again and again, Swami himself gave a powerful demonstration of that teaching via personal examples. Remember the famous letter Baba wrote to his elder brother in May 1947? One of the promises Swami made was that he would remove suffering. Quietly and barely noticed, Baba started a free general hospital in Puttaparthi in 1957. The hospital had a small and humble beginning, but already it was sending a strong message, which was that practical spirituality begins with service to the poor and needy. Do you know that the very first doctor to be appointed served in an honorary capacity? Thus, right from the beginning, Swami clearly demonstrated that it is His divine attraction and pure love that would be the driver and the prime mover for all His projects. That was way back in 1957. More than half a century has passed and during all that time, God on earth has never forgotten any one of His promises 
for even one single moment. He said he would give Ananda to all and sure enough he has been doing just that literally non-stop. He said he would lead people to the path of goodness and from spiritual darkness to light. By giving hundreds of discourses all over the place, Swami has been doing just that. And he promised to alleviate the suffering of the poor. Not for a moment has he forgotten that promise also. Who ever imagined that all this would happen way back in 1926 or in 1940 or for that matter even in 1950 when Swami moved to his permanent headquarters. But they have all happened. How? Because Bhagavan tapped the infinite power within him. The power of God Almighty himself manifesting as pure love. People often say, Oh, Sai Baba can do anything because he is God. We cannot be expected to be like him. We are different. <laughs> Truly speaking, this is just an excuse for inaction. Yes, Sai Baba is God in human form. There is absolutely no question about it because he himself has said so on many occasions. However, has he not told us so many times in fact that we too are God? He always tells us, I know I am God, but you do not. And that is the only difference. Why is it that we are not aware of the fact that we too are God? That Swami has explained is because of our spiritual ignorance. And how do we get rid of that ignorance? By paying attention to the message of Bhagwan Baba and following his teachings as best as we can. Well, this month-long teleserial is mainly being brought to you to create an awareness of those precious teachings and also of the wonderful personal examples that Swami has set for the whole of humanity throughout his life. That is all for the introduction and starting tomorrow, the focus would shift to the message proper. Please join us again tomorrow and meanwhile, we do hope that you are enjoying our presentation. Thank you for being with us. Jai Sai Ram.